What is mercy? I'm reminded of a story, it may be apocryphal, I may be repeating myself, if you've heard me say this one before, you've heard it before, but a mother once approached Napoleon Bonaparte seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain uh, misdeed or offence twice and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, he replied. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it, and mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. Now this morning I suggested that if you care for your soul and the mercy of God, I would encourage you to attend tonight. I didn't realize the weather was going to take quite such a turn for the worse. But well done, those of you who managed out this evening. It's lovely to see you tonight. What is so important that we need to discuss tonight? Well, let's first of all state some assumptions. If as a human race we have made some deplorable errors that interfere with our relationship with God and or as individuals we have gone well and truly astray, maybe even from our own moral compass, or even if we feel that there's just something that interferes with our personal access to our Creator. And if there's something that we might do about it, what does Scripture suggest that the answer might be? I want to concentrate on the passages of Scripture that we read tonight. Our opening verse from Hosea 5 verse 15 acknowledges this precondition that I've already tried to describe. There he says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. This is the English Standard Version that I'm uh, here reading from. I think we heard it read from the New International Version. I will return again to my place until... They acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. There's something distressing about being out of sorts with God. As a Christian, as a child of God, it's not comfortable to be estranged from our Heavenly Father. Yet that may be our experience. If we're distressed, there are some suggestions of remedy. But even for those who have never known God, the suggestions are the same. If there's a part of us that feels that something is missing, the suggestion is the same. We can't approach God criticizing him. We acknowledge our guilt and seek the face of of God. So here we are tonight, seeking the face of God. And that's a great start, especially if we acknowledge that we are in the wrong, not God. Then we have a starting place from which to converse. But it's the last verse of both of our readings that are of particular interest tonight. They say pretty much the same thing. We'll dissect them in a second. Hosea 6, verse 6, read this way. For I desire steadfast love, or mercy, and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. And then Matthew 9, verses 11 to 13. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said... Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, 
but sinners. Now in the days of Hosea the prophet, they ignored God. In the days of Jesus, they either ignored him or they criticized him. And this was the religious folk. There's a sense in which he's, he's almost happy to leave the self-righteous to their own desires. Because what he really wants are those who are humble enough to recognize that God is not at fault in their relationship, but we are. Our gentlemen especially address this to you if you've found yourself in a relationship where you are at fault, and she is not. You have only been in practice. You have only been in practice. As for the ladies, I'll say to you, you know fine well you're not at fault, so I'm not necessarily directly addressing you. But you know what I mean. Jesus says, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Similarly, it's folk who are sick that call the doctor, and it's folk who know that they have a need that call on God more often than not. But if that's who he wants, those who are sick, those who are acknowledging themselves as being in the wrong, who are sinners, who have a need, if that's who he wants, what does he want from us? What does he want from us? Well, Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I would desire mercy and not sacrifice. And here he was quoting Hosea, the other passage that we read. And the Old and the New Testament are helpful in understanding something about God and what he wants from his children. For I desire steadfast love, another translation for mercy, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, or knowing God, rather than burnt offerings. This was a people, even in Jesus' time, who understood the idea of sacrifice. They still had a temple, the second temple at this point, and they still had burnt offerings. And I'm not talking about the cooking variety. I'm talking about the type that were rendered up at the temple. There was a sense in which, when things go wrong in our own lives too, that our first recourse is to want to make some kind of sacrifice. We want to sacrifice something. When we make mistakes in life, we bring someone a present to make up. Perhaps flowers. Well, there's a giveaway, straight away. And if you're asked, what are they for? You're either betraying a guilty conscience or you're being tested, gentlemen. Be warned. We beat ourselves up. And in relation to God, we perhaps make all sorts of promises, which we then break. And so the cycle continues. But these weren't the things that pleased him. And they aren't the things that please him now. It's a perverse person who wants someone to kowtow to them all the time. Stuck in a cycle of guilt and fear, of self-loathing and hatred. And I don't believe for one minute that God wants his children in that state either. So okay, we've covered what God doesn't want. What does God actually want? Matthew says, or at least Jesus says in Matthew, I want mercy and not sacrifice. And Hosea states, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What are the two greatest commandments? Jesus asked, or was asked, that question. And his reply, to love the Lord your God with your whole heart and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now we've covered that he doesn't want us to hate ourselves, so self-love in an appropriate way obviously is appropriate. But he expects us to love one another, to take care for one another to look out for one another, to show mercy and steadfast love to one another. 
to care for the vulnerable, which is becoming more and more a rarity these days, and especially in the political climate that we find ourselves within. And also towards him, the language would infer. Towards him? Mercy towards God? In a few moments, we will partake of the Lord's Supper, where we are reminded that we are united with him. What hurts us, hurts him. He's not oblivious to our pain and struggle in life. What hurts him should hurt and grieve us. Which is why, as Hosea started, or at least the start of the, part of the passage that we picked up, started with, why when we are in distress and acknowledge our guilt, when something interferes with our relationship with God, at least if we're half awake, it does, it hurts us too, as it hurts him. Also, there were times, as the psalmist expressed on many occasions, that we might find ourselves raging at God for something difficult that enters into our lives. In context, it seems inappropriate that we would expect God to think as we do. As we mentioned this morning, his perspective is as creator. And so it's surely so very different from ours. But we do face hard things in life, and it can be incredibly difficult to understand why, especially when we expect God to protect his children, and then discover that our idea of protection can be at odds with his. It's hard to take a step back and to see it that way. But in the meantime, be merciful. Be merciful even towards our Heavenly Father who loves us so much and did not even spare his Son that we might be redeemed. After all, if our feelings are in doubt, it's not mercy if it's deserved, as that mother had to say. It's not mercy it is deserved. We heard also earlier that we can't approach God criticizing him. The right position to approach God from is in the acknowledgement of our guilt and to seek the face of God. But more than that, love the Lord your God with your whole heart and mind and strength. And as Hosea had it, I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What does this mean? That we take time to know him, to know him intimately, to understand to the best of our ability the way he ticks through experience and the experience of others in Scripture. And this takes time and effort, especially of reading and of prayer and of watching for his response Remarkably, God does want a relationship with us, which perhaps seem le seems less remarkable when we realize that we are his children. In fact, he demonstrated this to us in the example of his son who joined us in humanity and did not stand aloof. The example of a son who enjoyed a meal with his friends, likely with banter, and fun, and joy. This morning I suggested that if you care for your soul, and you care for the mercy of God, I would encourage you to attend tonight. You attended tonight. I trust that you are already finding your soul fed, and have a growing appreciation of the mercy of God especially in the words of Christ, I want mercy and not sacrifice. A mercy that is not deserved, but is freely offered, especially at the table of our Lord. Seek 
the face of God. Seek to know him and seek his mercy. And that which you desire, seek for others. Be merciful to others. Get to know others, even the vulnerable and the discarded. Love others. And God will surely bless us more than if we offered every sacrifice possible. Amen.